Moore Park, population then about 3,000. Not much by today's standards, but then enough to merit a one-hour special program by America's first genuine star of television news. The Susanna reactor started producing power early in November, and our cameras were focused on the town at 7.30 p.m. November 12, 1957, when for the first time in the United States, an entire community was illuminated by electricity generated by an atomic reactor. Enrico Fermi once looked at a reactor and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if it could cure the common cold? Here at Moore Park, a chain reaction that started with him washed the dishes and lit a book for a small boy to read. But less than two years after that dramatic send-off, something went wrong. Some of the fuel rods partially melted. Unit 4 has obtained these retouched photographs and drawings of the damaged reactor core, pictures of the first fuel-melting accident in a commercially producing nuclear power plant. Is there any comparison to Three Mile Island? The most uh, obvious uh, similarity was in the fuel condition and uh, between SRE and the, and the reported fuel condition at the Three Mile Island facility. For the next several days, we'll be showing you pictures of how the fuel melting incident happened and what was done about it. You'll hear from Atomics International and from independent consultants on how it was handled. We'll show you how the reactor is still being decommissioned now, 20 years after the accident. Despite the seriousness of the accident, even Edward R. Murrow might have missed its importance at the time. The official news release claimed there was no indication of unsafe reactor conditions, and newspapers treated the matter routinely. Local public safety officials weren't told much either. Today's the first time that I've heard of the 59 incident when you mentioned it a while ago. Two later incidents are much better known. By January of 1961, this reactor on the Idaho desert had been malfunctioning for two months, but it was operated anyway, until an explosion destroyed it. An explosion with so much force, it lifted the 60-ton reactor several feet in the air. A fuel rod plug shot up and impaled a maintenance man on the ceiling of the reactor building. The only two other people at work were killed, too. It took 1,200 people a year and a half to take the plant apart, and a large part of the Idaho desert will be uninhabitable for generations to come. But for the threatened loss of human life, the closest call before Three Mile Island was at the Fermi plant near Detroit a breeder reactor, the most dangerous kind of all. It, too, had not been working well, but was operated anyway, till in 1966 it came within seconds of melting down. It's now in radioactive mothballs. The Reader's Digest Press has called it a ghost that cannot be laid to rest. The sodium reactor experiment, or SRE, at Santa Susana was smaller than these, but the accident was severe. The man who compared it to Three Mile Island looked at several reports on the SRE melting. Once a high-level nuclear engineer with General Electric, he's now an independent consultant. So how well was the SRE accident handled? Well, I was really uh, appalled at the uh, sort of the cavalier attitude that they demonstrated following this very severe uh, event in uh, July of 1959 when, uh, when they had a lot of fuel damage. And, and the thing that that shook me the most was the fact that they had this severe power excursion, which means that the power was increasing rapidly, and uh, they got the thing shut down only by manually scramming the reactor after the scram system failed to do so. And yet, in less than two hours after they had terminated this event, they had started the plant back up as if nothing happened. Well, you have to go back at that stage of the game, which was, this was a power part of the power demonstration program. It was really a research tool. It was the first of its kind in the world. And so, as you have a first of a kind of anything, there were things that we were learning as well as operating. And part of that is the operating experience. Uh, as you, in retrospect of any type of thing, you can go back and find some data that says, hey, if you'd really looked at this, you might, might see things differently now that you've seen the end results. So the accident at Santa Susana was serious. About 10,000 curies of radiation were released in all. And yet there's room for debate on how well it was handled. Still, it has never been detailed in public till now. Tomorrow, we'll show you how the accident happened and how it can be evaluated in different ways, depending on your point of view. John?
there was a nuclear accident in the mountains west of Chatsworth. It happened 20 years ago. There was no large-scale public exposure to radiation. But the public has never been given details till now. And tonight, for the first time, Warren's going to tell us the story and show us the film on this. Warren? Thank you, John. Unit 4 has been able to dig up government films and documents that show what happened, and we've asked a nuclear engineer to evaluate them for us. He is Dale Breidenbaugh, formerly a high-level technical expert with General Electric. He's now an industry critic, although he says he is not anti-nuclear, and he works as an independent consultant both here and in other countries as well. You'll hear his comments. The reactor was located 35 miles from downtown Los Angeles. It was called the Sodium Reactor Experiment, or SRE, built for the government by Atomics International. It began operating in 1957. The accident happened in 1959. The SRE's most troublesome run began July 12, 1959. By the next day, the power was rising for no apparent reason. The control rods failed to stop it. The reactor failed to shut itself down, so it was stopped or scrammed by hand. Reports show the operators did not know what was wrong, but that somehow they decided the power excursion had not affected the reactor adversely. So they started it up again. That would be unheard of in today's safety atmosphere. What does it mean? What were the potentialities there? Well, there were a lot of things that they didn't know about uh, what had caused the power excursion. They were measuring high radiation uh, release uh, levels within the uh, reactor building, and they didn't know why uh, that release was occurring. And essentially, they didn't know what the reactor core condition was, but for some reason, uh, they felt they needed to get back in operation. The reactor continued to run for another two weeks, even though there was more trouble. It was shut down repeatedly for various reasons, including buildups of radioactivity in the building above the reactor. That's what led to the final shutdown 13 days after the first signs of trouble. John Walter was there at the time. He's still there. It was actually very undramatic. Um, uh, the evidence that there'd been some core damage uh, were some moderately high radiation levels. That, uh, as I recall, we had to evacuate this immediate area and for a short time uh, and uh, that then to really find out what happened, we had to remove the parts and put them in a hot cell to, to see what had happened to them. So it was uh, kind of actually anticlimactic. Anticlimactic or not, it was weeks before special equipment could be designed and constructed to find out what went wrong. The damage turned out to be very extensive. 13 of 43 fuel rods partially melted. 81 pieces of uranium fuel scattered around on the bottom of the core. Then things got worse. When operators tried to unload the fuel, some rods broke apart, as shown by these animated drawings on a government training film, which has never been shown in public till now. Some rods were found to have swelled in the excessive heat and stuck in place. Ultimately, the entire reactor had to be vibrated in order to shake them loose. Twenty years later, opinions still differ on how the matter was handled. A uh, slipshod operation, I guess, is the way I would describe it, uh, and, uh, uh, and just uh, uh, sort of a damn the torpedoes full speed ahead attitude, which is, uh, which is fine if you're fighting a war, I guess, but it is certainly not a way to run a reactor for a peaceful purpose, which is fine if you're fighting a war, I guess, but it is certainly not a way to run a reactor for peaceful purposes. Certainly people were following that reactor all the time. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees, and uh, in retrospect it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public, and we put the plant back on the line. The training film emphasizes the speed with which the reactor was put back online, but the operation took more than a year. Special grappling tools were engineered and constructed so radioactive garbage could be removed remotely under the eyes of television cameras since the reactor was too hot to open. A nuclear physicist who saw this film compared this to conducting heart surgery through the patient's nose. Enormous equipment had again to be designed and then built to rotate the 75-ton steel and cement plug that capped the reactor. It had to be moved each time a damaged fuel rod was to be taken out. 
That in itself was a delicate operation with special seals and containers required to make sure radioactive gas didn't leak out. Then the gigantic plug had to be rotated to the next rod so it could be taken out too. Fourteen months and millions of dollars later, the fuel had been shipped for burial in Beatty, Nevada. The SRE was operating again. But all this without any public notification. How dangerous might it have been? It's not that much of a hazard to even our local people, uh, as evidenced by the short period of time it took us to clean up the facility and recover it. Uh, the potential hazard of, of major release into the environment was just not there. It's obvious that uh, there was severe fuel damage suffered, either during the excursion or prior to it or just after it. Uh, some of it probably was aggravated by the uh, restarting of the reactor, uh, but it would have been possible, of course, for a, uh, a, a much more serious damage to have been incurred and for more radiation to have been released. As you could hear, it sounds a lot like the debate over Three Mile Island. Although there was the potential for serious public exposure, the hazards never developed. On the other hand, the public never was told how great the risks were. Tomorrow, we'll tell you more about what those risks really were and how they were handled. Kelly? Warren, where and how did you get your hands on that 20-year-old film of the accident and well, the documents as well? The, uh, the film and the documents are public records because the project was funded by the federal government. The problem is knowing where to look for them, and it was not easy to find them. Uh, the material that we got mostly came from the government, a lot of it Bridge the Gap, which is called Bridge the Gap, which is called Bridge the Gap, and documents and other things. Most of the material we got came from there. We also got, however, some material from Atomics International. They were very helpful and gave us some documents and also some film as well. And we got some material from from an outfit in, uh, in Westwood called Bridge the Gap, which is an anti-nuclear group. They were able to give us some government documents, too. I think they also gave a couple of things to the Los Angeles Times. All right, thanks very much, Warren. We look forward to the series continuing tomorrow night. The SRE was cooled not with water, as most reactors now are, but with sodium, a liquid metal. This animation, on a government film never shown in public before, shows the sodium filling up the reactor, going up between the radioactive fuel rods. When the fuel rods partially melted in 1959, the sodium absorbed the most dangerous of the materials produced by the accident, so they stayed in the reactor. But the operators did not know what had happened till some time after the accident occurred. The official reports almost sigh with relief. But it could have turned out differently. Luckily, the fission product release, that is the release of radioactive materials, was contained within the sodium. But there was always a chance that if fuel melting had proceeded unchecked, that it would have been released into the surrounding area, especially iodine and strontium. The iodine and strontium are very dangerous because the iodine goes to the thyroid glands of young children, causing thyroid cancer, and the uh, strontium goes to the bones of growing children, causing leukemia. So the worst stuff stayed in the sodium as it circulated through the reactor, transferring heat from the fuel rods to the steam, which generated electricity. But the sodium itself created another risk. It bursts into flame if it contacts water or air. A sodium explosion could have sent radioactive materials into the atmosphere. There were sodium accidents at the SRE, but none occurred during the partial fuel melting. Other less deadly gases, though, were released into the building above the reactor and ventilated into the outside air. What happened to them? Diffused over the decayed and disappeared. You have to look back at the population density of the Santa Susana in, the, in that period. You were up there the other day, but at that time it was a dirt road to Santa Susana. Uh, there was no population in the area. If there had been somebody there, what harm could those gases have done? Your lung tissue is very sensitive to radiation. The inhalation dose is 10 times the skin dose. And so noble gases uh, are very penetrating. They can go right through a gas mask. They can go through activated charcoal. They will bathe the lungs with beta radiation and gamma radiation and can cause cancer in the lung tissue. They, of course, they are also very rapidly dispersed because they are noble gases. They will not stay in the body like iodine and strontium. It's not clear how much of the less deadly gases actually were released. What evidence there is does not show contamination outside the reactor itself. And despite what might have happened, a 25-year veteran employee says he's not worried. 
I feel less concerned about it than I would do the long-term effect of the smog of Los Angeles, or and certainly what I get is uh, less than what I might get with medical x-rays if I had a GI series. Uh, um, I'm not getting, you know, nothing foreign is good for the body, but I, I feel that I'm taking a much less risk getting that small amount of radiation than I could with many, many other things in modern life. The reactor was shut down for good in 1964. Experimentation had been concluded and new safety requirements would have required expensive upgrading. For 10 years, it sat in what's called protective storage. Then in 1974, it was decided to tear it down. Decommissioning turned out to be an enormous operation, more expensive than the original cost of construction. A special torch operated at 80,000 degrees Fahrenheit underwater to shield the workers from radioactivity while they cut up the steel and concrete container that held the reactor. Even underwater, the torch could cut through six inches of steel at three or four feet a minute. Complex stainless steel plumbing posed special problems, pipes within pipes and elbows within elbows. Explosive cutting techniques used in oil fields were adapted to that task again with special precautions because of the radioactive contamination. Some pieces, like this 61-ton ring shield, were apparently too big to cut down, and they were packaged in plastic and shipped intact for burial in Nevada. Other equipment, like these radioactive waste tanks, were underground, and they had to be dug up before they were taken away. Some parts of the reactor building and some of the dirt around it were contaminated enough, so they had to be taken away as well. Though again, Atomics International insists there was never a public danger. Today, five years after it started, the process is still going on, although the reactor building is only a shell. Atomics International likes to say the decommissioning is providing experience that will help in taking other reactors apart, especially the breeder reactors, which also will utilize sodium cooling if that program ever gets off the ground. But the sodium reactor experiment, or SRE, it's been reduced to a hole in the ground. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is worried about sabotage. It has held up the shipping of spent fuel from the San Onofre reactor, saying it should not be moved through centers of population. At the same time, the Department of Energy allows large quantities of spent fuel to be shipped right up the freeway to Santa Susana, where the SRE used to be. These shipments are part of a project that started years ago, half a continent away. This is a son of the SRE at Hallam, Nebraska. Newer and bigger, it was based on the SRE, but lasted only a couple of years before it was abandoned for reasons much like those that finished the SRE. The spent fuel from Hallam was shipped from Nebraska to the nuclear dump at Savannah River, South Carolina, where it sat for about 10 years. Then, starting two and a half years ago, it was shipped to Santa Susana to begin reprocessing. Atomics International boasts the nation's largest hot cell, where radioactive material can be remotely handled by operators separated from it by 42-inch thick glass. Here, for two and a half years, the Hallam reactor fuel was prepared for reprocessing. The job was completed just one month ago. To get here, the fuel had to be trucked up the same steep, winding road this liquid oxygen truck is climbing, right past a couple of large mobile home parks, where business is brisk and the lots are filling up fast. Here, for two and a half years, the Hallam reactor fuel was prepared for reprocessing. The job was completed just one month ago. To get here, the fuel had to be trucked up the same steep, winding road this liquid oxygen truck is climbing, right past a couple of large mobile home parks where business is brisk and the lots are filling up fast. But in zoning the land, Los Angeles County paid no attention to the nuclear installation just over the hill in Ventura County. Here's the man in charge of environmental quality. Have you ever been contacted by either the state or the federal government or anybody else about what was going on at Atomics no. International? Do you feel from the contacts that you've had uh, in the last day or so that you should have been? Probably as a matter of information, it would, uh, it would have been nice. We talked to some of the people who lived nearest to Atomics International. None of them had ever been told what goes on there before. Their reactions were all quite different. I wouldn't buy if I knew that, okay? I mean, I really feel that strongly. But I was with the AEC up there in Richmond, Washington uh, for 19 years, and uh, all of this hoopla that you hear about uh, 
uh, well, how dangerous it is and so forth and so on. It's just a lot of hogwash. I've never been afraid of any of it. That I think anyone who has a fear of anything like that, that's as prominent as these places are, I think they should be told and given a chance to say, no, I don't want to live near. About 25 tons of the highly radioactive Hallam reactor fuel was shipped to Atomics International in a truck that looked something like this. It came one ton at a time over two and a half years, and each time the truck brought a ton here, it took another ton back to complete the reprocessing at Savannah River. 25 round trips across the country, 50 crossings in all, down the road to Topanga Canyon Boulevard. The Department of Energy cannot reveal the exact route, but a spokesman told us to figure it took the logical freeway. That means down the Ventura, through the valley to the Golden State, through downtown Los Angeles to Interstate 10 and east, back and forth, a ton at a time, for two and a half years. Is it a good idea to have them going through the freeways in the middle of Los Angeles? Uh, there's always a better way to transport radioactive material. If we could find a spot that was totally isolated of, of uh, people and, uh, and property, it would certainly be better than that. But uh, considering that these routes usually are selected uh, at times of the day when you have minimum traffic, it's probably the best compromise. The Department of Energy is very proud of the casks it uses to transport high-level radioactive fuel. This government film shows the kinds of tests that they're put to. They are smashed into concrete walls at 60 and 84 miles per hour. They are run into by speeding locomotives. They are carried on train cars that crash into concrete walls, all with no damage, nothing leaks out, according to the film. They are even subjected to an airplane fuel fire, 1,400 degrees the temperature outside the cask, 300 degrees inside, proving the insulation would prevent the fuel from melting. The government has a lot riding on the safety of these casks. By 1990, it figures there will be 3,500 shipments of high-level radioactive fuel every year, and some of them will be coming to Atomics International. Already, the hot cell is being prepared for fuel from the Fermi reactor in Detroit. That was a $130 million breeder reactor shut down before it ever produced any power because of a meltdown that came within seconds of getting out of control. The Fermi fuel is expected to get here next year. The public disclosure, in plain English, of what's to be done and why, I think is absolutely essential for not just the acceptability of nuclear power expansion, but the acceptability of what has to be done now, even if every reactor is shut down tomorrow. We've been able to show you in detail the fuel rod melting at Santa Susana, even the damaged reactor core, because the Department of Energy has a library of films and documents to support them at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Many of them are public records now, but you don't very often see them. So few people know about incidents like the explosion at this reactor on the desert near Idaho Falls which killed three people in 1961. One man was impaled on the ceiling of the reactor building. This reactor had to be buried, and the desert here will be contaminated for centuries to come. The Idaho reactor was built for the military. There have not been any similar incidents in the civilian reactor program, but there have been plenty of problems. In the same year as the Idaho incident, there was little publicity when the Supreme Court allowed the Fermi reactor to go into operation near Detroit, a major population center, even though it was argued that all the safety questions had not been resolved. Five years later, it came very close to melting down. It's now being converted to coal. The experimental SRE at Santa Susana was the first reactor to sell electrical power. There was a lot of publicity for that in 1957. But in 1959, when it suffered its fuel rod melting, the general public was not informed. And it's taken till this week, 20 years later, for the details to be widely broadcast. And once they were known, it turned out there was room for disagreement on how the accident was handled. Slipshod operation, I guess, is the way I would describe it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and just uh, uh, sort of a damn the torpedoes full speed ahead attitude. Certainly people were following that reactor all the time. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees. And uh, in retrospect, it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public. And we put the plant back on the line. But the reason for looking at old accidents, like the one at the SRE, is to get perspective on new controversies. 
Unit 4 has learned that there is controversy within the government itself right now over how radioactive fuel should be transported. The Department of Energy says the containers used to ship it are so strong that it's safe to use major freeways. It hands out this film to prove its point. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says the casks are strong all right, but that shipments on freeways are still vulnerable to hijacking. The NRC has turned down proposed fuel transportation routes to and from the San Onofre reactors because those routes would go through heavily populated areas. And the Diablo Canyon plant near San Luis Obispo has been held up because of a controversy, this time with the NRC initially pushing ahead, despite findings by the U.S. Geological Survey that a nearby earthquake fault might produce shakes stronger than the plant originally was designed to withstand. These and other controversies become more heated as they get better known, because the potential risks are so great. How great? Here's another member of the Commission on Three Mile Island. We're going to be debating that forever. I, I view nuclear power as zero times infinity. And what I mean by that is the chances of a serious accident are extremely remote. But what's troubling is that it's only one accident that extends toward infinity in terms of the kind of the damage and, and the catastrophic potential. Uh, Three Mile Island, I view as a very serious accident. People say nobody was hurt. That's not the issue. That plant was totally out of control. Uh, all the King's men uh, were totally confused. Uh, the core meltdown had begun before that plant was brought back under control. And that, to me, says a lot. Uh, we'll never have a perfect fix on uh, what that risk is. And the question is, can we assure ourselves that it's small enough to be worth taking?